My name is Seth Lazar. I'm a professor of philosophy at the Australian National University. My big question lecture is going to be about machine learning and moral and political epistemology. But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea and sky, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'm recording this on Narragoland. land. Before I start the lecture, um, I've made a Miro board that you can access. It's like an online whiteboard. You can add comments, questions, anything you like. The link should be popping up just about here. Um, so get onto that um, if you'd like to uh, share some thoughts about the talk um, after it's done. And obviously I'll be on Slack too and I'm looking forward to talking with you. So we're going to start from the fact that we have increasingly powerful systems that exercise increasing power over our lives. This is in part the offices of the administrative state, welfare decisions, healthcare decisions, decisions over housing are increasingly informed by data and AI. Decisions over how long someone's going to be kept in prison, whether they'll get bail or parole, are determined in part by risk predictions that are made by data and AI. And it's not just the government, the state, that is using these increasingly powerful systems, it's also the tech platforms, which govern a significant part of our lives, the lives that we spend online. And they might be determining what content you receive, and what prices or adverts you receive, or at the same time deciding what content gets kept on the platform and what gets taken down. So given that we're subject to these increasingly powerful systems, it's obviously crucially important that we design them in ways that both instantiate and promote our values. Now, it's important to pause for a moment and think about why it's key that they instantiate our values as well as promoting them. The fact is that most data and AI systems are built more or less on some form of statistical decision theory, the focus of which is always on outcomes. So it's sort of natural for folks working in this area to think that as long as you get the outcome sorted, then you're okay. But process also really matters. And that's what I'm drawing attention to by talking about instantiating our values. It needs to be that the system itself is designed and developed in a way that we can live with. So as an example of this, if you look at the recent work by Abeba Bahane, a cognitive scientist PhD student in Dublin, and her co-author, she's shown that the ImageNet um, data, um, library of photos that's been used to train many facial recognition algorithms contains misogynistic images, pornographic images. It's using the WordNet um, labels, so it has a lot of slurs, a lot of racial slurs. Really does not instantiate our values, and actually MIT has taken that down. Another way in which an AI system might fail to instantiate our values is if it's um, delivers a verdict but is not able to explain that verdict. Right? Sometimes it's really important that we're able to give adequate explanations and justifications for our decisions to others, and that's something that some kinds of machine learning would have find very difficult. And that again would be a failure to instantiate our values. So given that we have these increasingly powerful systems exercising increasing power, and we want to design them in ways that instantiate and promote our values, what does that entail? Well, it means answering at least three further questions. First question is, how do we decide how to decide which values to implement? This is really important. Um, it's obviously kind of the first, the founding question of democratic political theory. The next question is, if we can solve that one, which values should we then implement? This too raises really interesting philosophical problems. For example, should we apply the same standards to data and AI systems as we would apply to people who are performing that function themselves? Then the next question is in some ways the trickiest. How do you go about implementing these values within a particular system? Now, this is where there's been a bit of a roadblock in recent research, where attempts to incorporate moral reason through various types of symbolic approaches have hit various kinds of obstacles. There's some kind of fun stuff on trying to write things like the categorical imperative in terms that a computer can understand, but that's not super promising. And most people are generally worried that the, the moral landscape is just far too complex for us ever to be able to program it in this kind of way. Well, given the successes of machine learning in other domains, it's quite natural, therefore, that folks have tried to develop a connectionist alternative to using symbolic top-down approaches to incorporating moral reasons within data and AI systems. And most of what I'm going to talk about today really has to do with how the very reasonable attempt to use machine learning to solve this technical problem of how you implement moral reasons within a data and AI system has actually ended up answering that first question the how do we decide how to decide question, which is one that I'll argue on both moral and political grounds, it's particularly ill-suited to do. So let's look a little more closely at the kinds of machine ethics that has been done with machine learning. They're all sort of similar in one way or another, but it's worth thinking about some specific examples. So take the moral machine, for example. 
This was a, a, an online experiment that was done by folks at MIT. Basically, a bunch of cartoony trolley problems, and um, you can click which way you want the autonomous vehicle to go, whether you want it to uh, kill the person jaywalking or the pregnant person on the sidewalk. Um, a lot of fun. They managed to get 42 million responses, and they ran some regressions on that in order to figure out what people's values were. A slightly more philosophically sophisticated approach has been taken by the uh, Michael and Susan Anderson with their MedFX uh, model, which used expert judgments on a range of um, bioethics cases, identified five or six moral reasons, pro tanto duties, that were relevant to these cases and basically gave weights to each of those features and then inferred the judgments from the weights. A still more sophisticated approach has been taken by the people at the, the Moral AI Lab at Duke, led by Walter Sinnott Armstrong, where they've used, um, in this case, MTurk respondents, first to identify what features are relevant to a given problem and then to do the weights. They focus specifically on kidney transplants, um, the allocation of scarce resources, uh, kidneys when not everybody could have them, how do you prioritize? Other approaches have tried to use various forms of social choice theory in order to inform ethical decisions. So again, automation of various forms using machine learning to operate on people's preferences in order to then aggregate those preferences um, and deliver a verdict on a particular case. And some really kind of exotic approaches have been taken using inverse reinforcement learning um, in the Berkeley AI, AI lab, where they observe behavior, try and infer what people's preferences are from their behavior, and in some cases actually just from a static system, and then use that to provide the reward function for the reinforcement learning output. The basic thing that all of these approaches have in common is that they start with a corpus of judgments about cases or a corpus of behavior. Um, that might be users of MTurk's judgments, expert judgments, people playing um, the moral machine game, or even locals with an interest in the decision like the Carnegie Mellon approach using participatory algorithmic um, design. They then train an algorithm on that, um, whether it be using supervised machine learning or inverse reinforcement learning, and then they use that to extrapolate to new cases. So the real question we have to ask is, you know, suppose a system has been trained on this data and the model delivers a verdict on some case that isn't part of the training data. Uh, what kind of evidence does that give you for the particular verdict that it supports, that that action is impermissible or permissible? So to answer that question, we need to delve into moral and indeed political epistemology. Uh, and I'm a bit worried about the, the kind of evidence that these sorts of extrapolations are going to constitute. So, First, let's start with moral epistemology. It's worth getting out of the way the obvious objection that will, will, I'm sure have occurred to all of you, which is the old garbage in, garbage out problem. How reliable are these input judgments? I mean, if you're talking to folks doing the moral machine experiment, then honestly, I don't know why one would ever think that that should have any, be any guide to the moral truth. Mechanical Turk, I tend to think more or less the same, even as far as the experts go, well, you know, expert judgment, is important in these contexts, but I think then we get into the political question. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But let's set aside that whole garbage in, garbage out problem. And let's think for, for now instead about, you know, let's suppose you've got the best possible data you could get, whether it be of behavior or of judgments. Uh, and those worries are, are gone. And now the model is, you know, learning from your training data and you're applying it to these new cases. Let's think about what kind of evidence it would be in that case. My big worry about this kind of evidence, even when the data is good, is, it, is as good as it can be, is really that it's kind of impossible to avoid the problem of over, overfitting. So let me explain what I mean by that. Right? In ordinary moral philosophy, moral theorizing, we take it as a sort of given that our intuitions are not super reliable in the best case scenario. Now, you know, this might be because we have self-serving intuitions or because we're not properly able to appreciate other people's epistemic position, what it feels like to be them. There's lots of reasons why we should be a little skeptical about our moral intuitions. So there's really no good approach to moral philosophy that just involves kind of synthesizing all of your judgments, uh, identifying some ad hoc principle that delivers all of them, and then just extending that to new cases. The way that moral epistemology is usually seem to work best is when you try and you take those intuitions as a starting point for inquiry. And then the task of moral philosophy is to come up with what grounds those judgments, what explains them. By figuring that out, and ultimately that tends, tends to mean figuring out a principle that explains and underpins your judgments, 
you can then extend it to new cases. And the fact is that you've got to accept that some of your considered judgments are going to be ones that you have to reject. Sometimes you'll develop a principle and it will come up against a new considered judgment and you'll be like, no, my, I'm just so sure that I'm right about this case that I have to change the principle. But in other situations, you change the judgment in line with the principle. And there has to be that kind of give and take. So this is the, the notion, the approach to moral epistemology uh, called reflective equilibrium that was mainly pioneered by John Rawls. Now, why should we care about having these kinds of grounding explanations? Well, first of all, you know, the mere fact that a judgment on a new case is consistent with your judgments on other cases needn't be evidence that that judgment is correct, right? It could, it could be that you're wrong in all of those cases. It could be that this is an instance of self-serving, um, self-serving, self-motivated reasoning. It's a lot better when you have a new case if you can give something that actually explains and gives a reason why you should have this particular judgment. If you're identifying the properties that cause the verdict, then you can have more confidence in the judgment that you get. It's going to be more robust. But we also want to know the properties that cause the verdict because we really want explanations from people when they act. Like part of doing the right thing is that you do it for the right reasons. So another reason to worry about this machine learning based approach to moral epistemology is that essentially when you're dealing with a new case and the machine says, yes, the, the, the model says that it's permissible, all you've got to go on is that the model says it's permissible. You're not actually, you don't have any reasons for why it's permissible. You've got, you know, possibly many, many hundreds of thousands of, of features that have different weights. And this is what the algorithm has worked out is the best, best way to fit for all of those. Uh, but that's not a reason. You know, we should be concerned about overfitting. We should recognize that some of our intuitive judgments are going to be wrong and they're noisy and they need to be discarded. We should want an explanatory grounding principle that unifies all of our judgments as best it can and enables us to discard those that conflict with the principle as long as we think that the principle is more plausible ultimately than our judgment in that case is. We want to do things for the right reasons. But also there's a further reason why we want to proceed in a, in a way that allows for a greater degree of contestation about how you extend your moral views to new cases. And this is if you think that any part of morality fundamentally is socially constructed. If you think that the very fact that something is right in a particular choice in part depends from the process of mutual justification, then we can't simply discover what the underlying moral reality is through the process of machine learning and then just sort of extract that within our model. Like it's actually the, the process of going to what Rawls called wide reflective equilibrium, where you go beyond your own judgments and you start to engage with other people and deliberate with them. That's actually really crucial and it's not something that you can short circuit. And obviously that brings me to the objections from political epistemology. Uh, and here the point is really very simple. The, the question of how we decide how to decide, in a way that's all of politics. That's fundamental. It's the heart of democratic theory. And we cannot short circuit it by using an algorithm to aggregate preferences or to learn what people's judgments are in other similar cases. It's absolutely vital that for that part of the process of figuring out what our value should be, we have a robust democratic discussion that involves things like that research paper I mentioned earlier, pulling out all of the problems with the, 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 the image databases that have been used to train facial recognition algorithms. It involves holding companies and governments to account and having the kind of robust political discussion that we need to have. And that needs to be, you know, that, that's going to be a hard discussion. It's one that has to take into account the interests of all those who are affected by these systems, but beyond that also environmental considerations, indigenous protocols for AI need to be incorporated. We need to recognize, especially for people like me working here in Australia, um, that we're operating under conditions of massive historical injustice. That all has to be part of the discussion that goes into figuring out what the reasons are, are that should go into our data and AI systems. To short circuit all of that with a machine learning algorithm is to short circuit democracy itself. And that's a really bad idea. So the big question is, where do we go from here? It's all very well to be critical, but what are the positive next steps that we can take? Well, I think what we really need to do is to go back to those two questions. How do we decide how to decide and how do we implement? And we need to really keep them separate. The process of deciding how to decide, that's really something that we have to do as, a, as political communities through the democratic process. We need to take into account these different perspectives. We need to have open and robust political debate. And absolutely one of the most important things in doing that is that we need to ensure that these kinds of decisions aren't being made for us by the executives of tech companies. It's really important to have a participatory democratic approach.
in order to resolve that question of how we decide how to decide. And then there's the question of how to implement. And then I think that the biggest, the biggest successes are going to come if we try, rather than thinking about, you know, uh, formally modeling the categorical imperative or whatever, um, start to think about specific application scenarios, specific uses and specific things that we want to encapsulate. We need to work out what it means for data and AI systems to instantiate our values. So that means getting clearer on things like what development processes we think are okay, when we think the labor practices involved in, in labeling data are okay, you know, what we should expect of an image recognition algorithm, um, what we should expect of the, the databases that are used to train facial recognition algorithms. Like we need to do a lot of that fundamental work in essentially moral and political philosophy in order to art articulate how we can develop systems that instantiate our values. And that's not necessarily going to involve mathematizing morality within those systems. That's about the architecture of the systems themselves. It's about figuring out what the goals are, figuring out why we care about explanations, why they matter and what that would look like. But then we have to address developing the systems themselves and designing the systems in a way that takes these sorts of reasons into account. And I think we need to proceed by in, a, in a more or less piecemeal way, focusing on specific domains of application, what the moral reasons are that are relevant in that context and how we can incorporate them. And that will involve using you know, some tweaking of machine learning algorithms that will involve some symbolic work. Uh, but when you focus on a specific application domain, like for example, the use of a planning algorithm to allocate electricity within a power grid, that's gonna have specific fairness questions that are going to arise that you're need, gonna, going to need to incorporate. So once we focus on those specific domains of application, I think that the problems will be tractable. Um, they'll be hard, but they will be tractable. At the end of the day, I think that to a person with a, with a new hammer, everything looks like a nail. So it's quite understandable that folks would try this kind of con connectionist approach that basically uh, short circuits two and a half millennia of moral and political philosophy, as well as the democratic process. Um, and it produces some really interesting and exciting results. But I think uh, a better way to proceed is to start working together, philosophers, political theorists, cognitive scientists, working together with data scientists, AI researchers, um, and then working in a context of a much broader democratic public discussion in order to figure out what kinds of values we should incorporate into these systems. Um, and then working out how to implement it in that kind of collaborative way. I don't think we can get very far by short-circuiting all of those other fields using machine learning. Um, and I think that the prospects for what we can achieve when we do work together on these are really exciting. <laughs>